Hi, my name is Lillian. I'm 58 years old and have experienced 34 years of covert domestic violence, otherwise known as narcissistic abuse. But I'm not just a survivor. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. If this is your first time, thanks for stopping in. And to get a wider scope of what I talk about here, you can uh, look in the description box. There's a link that says why I'm here. If you're returning, I'm sorry you're walking through this, but I'm glad you found your way here. And you know, I'll always remind you to listen to my content with that one question in the back of your mind. Is my marriage difficult or am I married to a dangerous man? That's the motivative motivation for this channel, what my marriage was like and how I woke up to the truth that my husband wasn't a difficult, clueless guy when it came to relationships. No, he knew a lot, actually, and that's what made him, makes him such a dangerous man. If you're starting to wake up and think that this might be your reality, please be gentle on yourself. You're about to step on a rough ride of truth. A darkness you've never experienced, but just know that you're not alone. I'm here for you. I hope this channel will be a source of awakening, validation, healing, and will show you how God uses a righteous divorce to free you from bondage of narcissistic abuse in your marriage. As you're listening, if you start to feel overwhelmed or have any weird sensations inside your body, that means your emotions are reacting to something that's been hidden in your nervous system. Pause the video, pray, and ground yourself if you need to. I've listed some verses and a few videos on grounding basics in the description box. When you experience these overwhelming emotions, try and press into them and see what they're trying to tell you. It's no different than feeling physical pain. It's an indicator that something's wrong inside your body. Weird feelings and strong emotions, usually in the form of fear, they're a warning system. There's trauma in your soul. There's a wounded area that needs to be healed and restored. I understand sometimes you can't press into these intense feelings because of the situation you're in or because you're just not around a safe person. This is when it's better to practice grounding. But you always want to come back to those feelings though and sink into them so you can examine them. You never want to stuff and ignore emotional warnings that your soul is showing you. In this video, I want to broadly examine creature instincts and uh, compare natural responses and behaviors. Cows moo, dogs bark. Deciduous trees lose their leaves in fall, evergreens don't. Cherry trees produce cherries and maple trees release sap in the spring. Everything that lives does what it was created to do. God is not the God of confusion. He wouldn't create an apple tree that's native to Canada, then it's expected to produce oranges as if it was growing in Florida. He wouldn't expect the tide to rise without the phases of the moon. When he created the tide to respond to that very thing, he wouldn't create a cat to purr as a sign she's safe and happy, and then expect her to purr when she's not happy or pleased or worse, afraid, abused and neglected. Yet, this is exactly what the church has been telling wives to do. We've been told to respond in a way that God did not create us to. And what's worse is that when a wife doesn't, she's treated like she's contentious or disrespectful or worse, a liar or neurotic. This idea of acting respectful in the face of a husband who's neglectful, hate and hateful is contradictory to the operating system that God created females with. At best, it enables relational irresponsibility and laziness of our true brothers in Christ. But at its worst, it sets up lambs in the flock to be consumed by the wolves. 
When we hear the word lambs in Christianity, we immediately get an image of babies and children's ministry. That's not what Jesus meant when he was talking to Peter. Lambs are not the metaphor for baby humans. Lambs are the weak and damaged and hurt and neglected of the whole flock of sheep, the souls within the congregations. Lambs on the outside look like sheep, but the person inside is a lamb. They're young and immature in the faith, and they're wrecked in faith or bruised in the soul or the ones like me, a completely shattered heart and a fragmented mind. Like me, those of us with a soul so broken that it's been reduced to its constituent particles, that it's non-existent. As a sheep, we're so unhealed, so unguarded and vulnerable that we believe abuse is love. Truly the weakest of the weaker vessels. They are the most defenseless and the ones most susceptible to the evil from the wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm talking about hidden abuse in Christian marriages. It's been perpetuated through this lie found in Ephesians 5.33 for too long. Wake up, sisters, and feel your feminine power that God infused into every cell of your body at your conception. It will heal you. The very act of telling a creature to be something other than what it's created for is the definition of abuse. It means to use wrongly. The corrupted teachings of Ephesians 5.33 has brought corrupted practices. Our feminine femininity has paid the price for too long. When it comes to females, it's disingenuous to expect a wife to respond with a raging fire of feminine vulnerability loaded with respect, reverence, esteem, adoration, and deference when all she's been given to work with is wet wood. Females reflect, respond, and respond and enlarge whatever is planted in them. It's our nature to do so. It's what we are. Wives aren't magicians miraculously creating relationships where there's been no intentional connection, like the intentional connection Jesus, as the head, demonstrates for his church. The most obvious and tangible way wives enlarge whatever's planted inside of them is when they receive that seed from a husband and then within our bodies, it gets enlarged into a human. It's not just with that, what we can see. We produce whatever we receive relationally. Love gets planted inside of us and then it gets revealed. The hidden becomes visible. We receive and respond. Wives are reflectors and revealers of what's been planted in the soil of our soul in secret, and then it grows bigger. Like those examples of the creatures in, and nature that I talked about earlier, God wouldn't create a female estrogen-driven being and then expect her to operate like she's living in a testosterone-driven body. That's like saying, think and process information like a man but act like a woman. This creates a schism in a woman's soul and it breaks her down. It's a recipe for the destruction of a woman's femininity, not masculine care of her as the weaker vessel. This idea of women thinking like men is for one purpose, so the man doesn't have to think and act as hard as far as relationships go. Remember in my last video when I said that the translators have tried to help God by equalizing the commands, but the outcome has been to increase the weight of responsibility onto femininity while decreasing the weight of masculinity? Instructing a woman to think like a man and act like a woman 
This is a classic example of that. The man is the stronger vessel. He's supposed to bear more weight and work and responsibility of the relationship to be created in the body of a woman, but process information like a man is to use femininity wrongly. It's abuse. This is exactly the kind of knowledge that's backwards to God's kingdom. It's the opposite of his nature. He doesn't confuse or contradict. He is clear and in alignment. Do you see? He wouldn't create the female to reflect what she's received, then direct her to lie about what she's received. He wouldn't saturate every cell of her brain, soul, and heart in estrogen as she's being created in the womb, and then say, don't respond in your feminine feeling and thinking, which is the purpose of estrogen. For a wife to not respond as this feminine creature is to be the opposite of the helper she was created to be. This deceives God. It defies his law of sowing and reaping. When I discovered that my husband was not loving me like his own body, I chose to believe the lie in Ephesians 5.33, and I responded with respect like he was loving me. I was so wrong. It was deceptive to God and his spiritual law of sowing and reaping. That law is universal and it includes relationships. When a husband is unloving or unkind and that wife responds like his actions are kind, even when she's feeling unloved, she's giving him feminine cues that speak directly to his masculinity. These cues tell him that he's right on track, but that's not the truth. She's training him to be less of a man, not more. That's not a helper. When respect is not authentic, it's not just deceptive towards God and works against the law of sowing and reaping. It's also deceptive towards her husband. Allowing your husband to reap respect when he hasn't done the work of sowing the seeds of love into you, you're circumventing a spiritual law. And believe me when I tell you, it's going to cause a lot of pain in your heart and a lot of damage to your soul. The church cannot receive connection without its head. If its head will not send forth the connection towards it, it's a lie to think there'd be the church. If Christ had not left heaven to lay the foundation, create his kingdom by pursuing each and every one of us. This takes work. Christ is always pursuing, always building. Husbands are compared to the head, like Christ is the head. They are always to be pursuing in love towards their wife for connection, just like Christ is with the church. A husband is commanded to love first by cleaving. Then his wife receives it and responds. Relationship building is his responsibility. Responding authentically in truth is her responsibility. If your husband is difficult, you send him the wrong message, you're not being a true helpmate. This is recoverable and reconcilable. A difficult husband might be relationally hard, but his motives are good. Remember, he is a sheep like you. But if you're married to a dangerous man, you continue to absorb all the responsibility of the relationship by pretending you're experiencing real love. You're digging yourself a mental and an emotional grave by allowing yourself to be dehumanized by the religious dogma that's blinded you. It's blinded you into thinking that a sheep can be one flesh with a wolf that's only pretending to be a sheep. God created you female so that you'd be honest, vulnerable, and transparent about how you feel. That's femininity. And lastly, but not least, when you pretend to be experiencing love, it's self-deceptive to not steward your own gifts, skills, and talents as a woman in relationship with God. You destroy yourself on every level, mentally, emotionally, and physically, when you do not live in the operating system of femininity the way God created you to be. 
to pretend that you're experiencing a real friendship with your closest neighbor, your husband, to imagine that you're in a real partnership of building a one flesh marriage, to live in the make believe fairy tale that he is cherishing you as a sister in Christ, in real kindness and love, to dream he's really cleaving to you when he's not doing any of it is crazy making to you. You're using your skill of analytic thinking in your head to deceive the girl in your heart into thinking that she feels loved, but she knows the truth. In the beginning of the series, I asked you a question, one that I've threaded throughout each part, and I want to end with it. Is your marriage balanced? If it's truly a one flesh, living, breathing, moving relationship, you will feel it. The longer you've been married, the more patterns you have in order to experience exposure, right? What you think about your marriage in your head becomes more congruent with what you feel in your heart. That's your gut. They align. That's balance. I don't mean perfection. People, perfecting people is God's business, not ours. What I mean is you'll experience a balance that's progressing in capacity towards each other. But if your marriage is merely a series of exchanges of services that you do for each other, then you think you've got a marriage, but in reality, what you've got is a functional job description that masquerades like a marriage. You're living in the make-believe world of the dangerous man. Truly, a nightmare that you've been led to believe will one day, someday in the future, be your happily ever after. Closing thoughts. First, shh, don't say a word about this to him. Discovering that your husband's dangerous is a scary place to end up. It's never where you thought you'd be, and it feels like an unreality. But your silence about your awareness of what he really is, that's your safety zone. And always remember, a clueless guy that causes dysfunction and seems difficult, he's not dangerous. But the malignant man is not clueless. He just pretends to be difficult and dysfunctional so that he can hide how dangerous he is.